For more than a decade, Bitcoin has made waves across multiple sectors as the world's first and largest cryptocurrency. In this interview, we spoke with Dhruv Bansal, co-founder and chief science officer of Unchained Capital, to get a better understanding of Bitcoin's potential in the federal space and learn more about how it can transform network security. If you enjoy this interview, please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. And if you're interested in being interviewed, please email summer at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Dhruv Bansal, co-founder and chief science officer of Unchained Capital. Dhruv, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Summer. Bitcoin has been around for over a decade, but it's still somewhat nascent. Bitcoin is often described as a new kind of digital money, but Bitcoin advocates also speak of applications outside of the directly financial, such as Bitcoin's interaction with energy markets. Dhruv, you believe that Bitcoin can change the game in network security. Can you explain how? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Summer. Um, and, and you're right. Bitcoin is, I think, best described as a new kind of money. But because money is a part of almost every economic transaction, exchange of goods and services in the world, money touches everything. And so if Bitcoin is a new kind of money, it has an opportunity to disrupt a lot of other industries in interesting ways. Um, that's true of the energy markets. It's true of uh, telecommunications and the Internet, some of which we'll talk about today. I want to focus on an area that not enough people talk about, in my view, which is how Bitcoin will affect the world of computer security and network security online. Um, to be clear, I think computer security has always, always had an economic component. If we think about the way that we develop secure software, there's always a risk and cost trade-off that any company that maintains or develops software has to think about. Um, it's expensive to build secure software, to do the testing and planning and design necessary to make sure you don't have security bugs or um, abilities for your software to serve as an entry point into an end user's environment. Oftentimes it is cheaper, it is more economically rational for an organization to not do that work, to just ship with whatever bugs that may exist. And if they're discovered, they'll be reported, they'll be patched. Um, and that way you don't have to prevent them, you just have to react to them. Um, if the risk is really low, I mean, if your software is, is you know, let's say not mission critical software, this is maybe an acceptable way to economically treat computer security. Uh, if the risk is low, the willingness to defend against attacks is low. If the risk increases, <clears throat> the cost and the effort that organizations and individuals will put into defending themselves will have to increase as well. That's just kind of the basic economic trade of, of network security. Um, there's an aspect here of attack vectors as well that matters. It's not just defense. An attacker needs to be able to profit directly from attacking a computer system. Um, I think the rise of ransomware is a really interesting case study uh, to, to sort of look at here. A ransomware, you know, it, it, the, the method of ransomware is to, to break into somebody's computer, encrypt some files, and then charge the money in order to get the decryption key to get their files back, right? Lots of people have data. Uh, that's a, can be either your personal photos or your business records. That can be a devastating impact. You're potentially willing to pay the ransom. What I find interesting is that the attack of ransomware might have existed long before Bitcoin, all right? In, in 2008, let's say we had the internet. We had vulnerabilities in computers. We had people with lots of data that they valued. We had encryption algorithms. Why didn't we have ransomware in that era? And I think the answer is you can't break into someone's computer and encrypt their files and then ask them to pay you via check or cash somewhere. That's not a practical way for an attacker to get paid. Um, it required Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies for attackers to be able to actually get paid their ransoms and be able to get away with it, so to speak. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are very good at private transactions. Um, and that actually enabled ransomware. Um, it's interesting. So there, I'm, I'm trying to argue that there's an economic reason that ransomware exists beyond just the technological reason. Um, the defense of ransomware actually in the modern era is also interestingly economical for a lot of businesses who are concerned about being ransomed instead of protecting against being ransomed. A strategy that a lot of businesses look at and, and employ is just paying ransoms. So understanding what the cost of a ransom would be and weighing that against actually defending against it occurring in the first place is also a reasonable economic strategy for some businesses. Again, an example of how economics is always a part of computer security. Um, I do want to, though, address, I think the most interesting part of this is what about the high end of the security market? Um, large corporations, uh, government agencies, intelligence agencies, 
uh, folks for whom computer security is extremely valuable. They're not economically necessarily limited. The risk is already really high. They're willing to invest arbitrary amounts of capital and staff to, to protect their networks. Surely they succeed, right? Uh, and the answer is they don't. Um, those players also fail. Um, no computer networks today are really secure. The Google, Google has been hacked. Microsoft has been hacked. The NSA has been hacked. Um, and I'm still making the claim that that's an economic problem. Um, and I think in particular, the reason why at the highest tiers, computer security is vulnerable is because of the concept of zero day vulnerabilities and specifically a market that exists for the buying and selling of zero day vulnerabilities. So Dhruv, what exactly is a zero day vulnerability? Can you describe the market for zero day vulnerabilities and how does this market impact federal agencies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, uh, for uh, most agencies, there or for folks at the higher end of computer security, they're very good at computer security. They're able to protect against all the known threats that they know about. A zero day is scary because by definition, a zero day is an exploit in the computer system or software application that attackers know about, but defenders do not know about. So there's an asymmetry in knowledge. Um, and what that means is defenders can't protect against this because they don't know that it's happening. There is a time period over which an attacker may know about a vulnerability in the defender system, but the defender may not. And so the defender is hard pressed to say that they are have a secure network if they don't know the kinds of vulnerabilities that they're supposed to be protecting against. The reason that these exploits exist fundamentally, I'm also going to claim is economics and market forces. So let's consider like an example. You're a computer security researcher. Maybe you're a hacker, you're an attacker. You discover a vulnerability in some software. Um, what is your next action? Um, you may not be able to directly exploit that vulnerability yourself, even if you are someone that is willing to engage in that kind of, let's say, immoral or unethical behavior. You might not be able to um, exploit it yourself because, you, let's say, hacking into someone into Microsoft Edge or something, some other you know piece of software, it might not be a way for you to directly profit from that. And you might not want to engage in ransomware because ransomware is actually a very expensive form of attack for attackers. It takes a lot of effort. You might report the bug in kind of a white hat way and hope to get paid a bug bounty because you reported a bug, but there's only so much money you might get paid for that. If your bug is a particularly juicy one, your exploit is particularly nasty and you know that it could be used to attack and, and hurt people perhaps, it might make more economic sense for you as an attacker with dubious morals to sell your exploit in a, um, in a dark web, often uh, market for zero day exploits, exploits that now someone you knows about, but defenders don't. And the reason this makes sense is because there's someone in that market that has a uh, opportunity to use your exploit to actually do something that is valuable to them. A nation state, an intelligence agency, a corporation may find that they have a target that they want to get to and your zero day helps them get there. So it's not valuable to you directly as an attacker because you lack opportunity or target, but it is valuable to other entities in the world as attackers and they can purchase it from you. And that's why the market exists. It fundamentally exists to connect those who discover exploits with those who can really profit from them and to pay the former uh, from the latter. Interestingly, now we've reached the point where these markets have become mature enough where there's actually another class of buyer, which is the companies who actually develop and maintain software that often buying their own exploits in these dark web markets is an economic strategy that they use to limit their own risk of exposure. So these markets are very well developed um, and the government knows about these, like the government participates in these markets. I think one of the most famous recent hacks that occurred or breaches or leaks was a collection of zero days maintained by the NSA, famous shadow brokers example that were being sold for Bitcoin. So a perfect example of the government investing and in owning and wanting to hoard these zero days as well as other attackers and entities in the marketplace and then being sold directly for Bitcoin. Um, I'm gonna make the claim that while Bitcoin is clearly involved in these marketplaces to some degree as a transaction currency, um, Bitcoin itself as a piece of software is very exceptional. I, I don't believe it suffers from zero days. Um, and I can talk about why. Um, and furthermore, I believe that this property of being secure against zero days is a characteristic that can be exported or inherited uh, to other software in the future um, uh, as Bitcoin continues to grow. Why is Bitcoin such secure software and why is it not subject to zero day exploits? Um, again, I think this comes back to economic forces. So for First uh, reason, Bitcoin is open source. And like a lot of open source projects, the Linux kernel, the Apache web server, um, it benefits from the idea that all bugs are shallow if you have enough eyes, right? So Bitcoin has that going for it. But beyond uh, those other more famous examples, perhaps of open source or, uh, projects, Bitcoin is money. That's, and that's very different. 
Um, if there existed a known exploit in Bitcoin that allowed an attacker to steal Bitcoin or steal coins or compromise wallets in some way, um, that exploit would be being used and it would be seen, it would be seen in the wild, right? The, there's no gap for the discoverer of that exploit and the ability to profit from it. You don't have to go sell the exploit in a zero day market. And in fact, that's not a rational action to take because if someone else were to discover that exploit, now they'll use it. And of course, once the exploit is used in the wild, everyone sees it and now it becomes a known vulnerability that can be patched and mitigated. So my argument is that it's, it, there's an old joke about the economists, you know, two walk down the street and there's a hundred dollar bill on the ground. The first one says, oh, that's a hundred dollar bill. And the second says, oh, it can't be. If it were, someone would have picked it up. All right. So it's, there's kind of an element of that here where is there a known exploit in, in Bitcoin? Um, well, no, there can't be because someone would be exploiting it right now if it existed. Now, to be clear, I keep using the word known exploit, right? As in zero day, an exploit which is known about by attackers, but not by defenders. There, of course, could be unknown exploits in Bitcoin. There could be vulnerabilities and bugs that no one knows about. I'm not making the claim that Bitcoin is perfect software. I'm merely making the claim that any exploit that were severe enough to, Bitcoin has many shallow bugs, of course, but any exploit that were severe enough to cause the loss of coins or funds or the interruption or dissolution of the network, it would be being exploited right now. That's a very unique characteristic. Um, and that's what leads me to believe that Bitcoin has no zero days by definition because of how monetary um, it is as an application. You said the security properties of Bitcoin could be inherited by other software in the future. Can you explain how that would work? Yeah, again, it's coming back to economics, right? If you believe my claim that Bitcoin doesn't have zero days because if an exploit were discovered, it would be immediately used by the attacker who discovered it, then there's other categories of software that aren't Bitcoin, but they're very close to Bitcoin. Bitcoin wallet software, security software, their interfaces with Bitcoin private keys and other applications that move and spend Bitcoin today. Those software, I will conjecture, are, are similar to Bitcoin in that bugs in those software that are critical, you know, the things we use to interact with Bitcoin, those can also lead to the loss of funds or the, or the seizure or theft of Bitcoin. And so similarly, if there were known exploits in those software, which are adjacent and directly connected to Bitcoin, they would come out more quickly. I think there's less zero days likely and perhaps none in those kinds of software for similar reasons as they wouldn't be in Bitcoin. And this is really the pattern. As software grows to embrace Bitcoin, as Bitcoin grows to become more valuable and more embedded in all sorts of everyday functions and therefore everyday software, um, more software will be directly attackable if exploits are discovered in it. Um, it's too, too large of a topic to get into here, but another area where Bitcoin, I think, has many interactions that might be unexpected is the notion of Bitcoin telecommunications, data, online computing, uh, and Bitcoin meaningfully rebuilding the uh, infrastructure and economic incentives behind the internet. So instead of paying directly on ISP uh, for bandwidth and, and then using it in some way uh, mediated by that centralized provider, you might be directly paying to send emails. You might be directly paying for bandwidth that you're consuming in your browser as you're using the internet, um, settling it in Bitcoin with other providers of let's say mesh networking, other things. This is a trend that will take many, many years to, to work out, but we're already seeing it happen um, today. There are already mesh networking applications that use Bitcoin and incentivize people through Bitcoin. Um, they'll continue to grow. In that world, almost all software is using Bitcoin. Um, to return to the you know, Microsoft Edge example, if, I, if I'm an attacker and I discover an exploit in Microsoft Edge, all I, need, all I might need to do is have you request images from my server, you know, request one by one pixel gifts from me. Those will cause your software to pay me money. And suddenly I can exploit that very broadly, very quickly. And again, the exploit will be seen and then it will be patched. Um, so a little bit I'm saying as Bitcoin grows and as software grows to embrace Bitcoin, attacks will become easier and more profitable. That sounds very scary, right? Uh, to a degree, I am saying that, but I'm saying that the effect of that will be that software will have to grow and adapt to become fantastically more secure than it is today. That the expectations of consumers and businesses who use software will more focus on security than it does today because the risk of bad software will be much greater. Instead of, frankly, losing privacy or losing personal information about uh, clients or consumers and then you know, having to pay a, a modest fee um, because of that, like that's that kind of tap on the risk behavior doesn't incentivize businesses to really care about security, being directly losing money and Bitcoin and wealth that does incentivize people. So I think there will be, if you like, an immune response that will cause us to invest in security a lot more directly. Um, and I think that analogy is actually a pretty good one 
Um, if you think, if we think about biology a little bit, um, our immune systems are under constant attack all the time and they evolve incremental responses, um, to that constant attack. Um, immune systems aren't perfect. Uh, we witnessed recent pandemics and other kinds of, you know, horrifying events. But if we really think about the efficiency with which they solve that problem, the complexity of it, our immune systems are incredible. They're extremely robust, um, and smart. And to a degree, I think changing the economics of computer security to make attacks more profitable, more common will cause that immune response and cause us to evolve a little bit instead of engineer. Um, and that will bring some of the robustness perhaps of biology and immune systems and other things to more engineered human systems. And I think this is a pretty interesting and speculative outcome here um, that uh, Bitcoin will actually be a sort of hidden economic driver to really delivering next generation, really secure software. Lastly, can you talk about your vision for the future of cryptocurrency in the government space as it matures? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think um, if you followed my arguments, if you've been willing to um, uh, come with me this far, um, you might see that a nuanced response to Bitcoin is important. That sometimes Bitcoin, it's new, it's scary, it's novel. It doesn't work the way that we expect it to. And at first order, uh, whether it's the energy usage, whether it's the, you know, the freedom of transactions and the uncensorable and private nature of them, whether it's um, the idea that attacks and computer security become more profitable and immediate, these can be very scary first order effects. But I think the second order effects, um, and, and negative ones, by the way, but I think the second order effects um, can be really positive. Um, change is often painful. And I think uh, whether we're talking about energy, whether we're talking about private transactions, whether we're talking about computer security, I think the long-term outcome is actually a better system, a more robust system, a more distributed system that um, is fairer to its participants um, and better aligned with their interests than the centralized systems that we have today. Um, and so I think a nuanced response from government is what I'm hoping for as well. Um, if we react too quickly out of ignorance or fear or, or lack of familiarity, um, we set ourselves back as a nation uh, with respect to the rest of the world that is, that is more open perhaps to embracing Bitcoin and, and witnessing the changes that it will create in their societies. Uh, the good news is that Bitcoin is uh, very popular in the United States amongst individuals. There is a increasing commercial uh, focus on Bitcoin. My own company, Unchained, uh, focuses on Bitcoin and banking and security. Um, there are a lot of U.S. citizens that want Bitcoin to succeed in the United States and are willing to educate and interface with regulators, um, government representatives, uh, other leaders to make sure we do take that nuanced, smart response. Um, Bitcoin is here to stay. We're not going to get rid of it. And it's not something we want to get rid of. Um, it's going to make the world better. Um, it's going to be a painful transition. But if we can guide it and um, respond in a nuanced way, I think we're going to get the best out of it. Well, Drew, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your insights with us. Thank you, Summer, for having me. This was really fun.